Okay. So we will get officially started. I know we'll have more people joining, you know, in the next few minutes, but um, I want to introduce myself again. I am Suzanne Nobles. I'm a senior manager for adult learning here at Digital Promise. My partner in adult learning work is Patty Constantakis. She's not able to join us today. She's doing some video work in Kentucky right now. Um, but I know she's excited that all of you all are here as well. Um, so our webinar today, There is No Comprehension Without Picturing, will be led by two great experts from Mockingbird Education. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to introduce them and then they will take over the screen and begin. So first of all, Shannon Sims is the Director of Construct uh, Curriculum and Instruction at Mockingbird Education. And she has over 10 years of direct experience teaching vulnerable learners in, the adult basic, in, in adult basic skills and 19 years as a professional development provider. Recognized for her abilities in instructional design, Shannon wrote contextualized ABS curriculum for the state of Oregon with the Ocean Math and Science Collaborative Project. We also have Dina Craddock here, the learning technology specialist from Mockingbird Education. And Dina is a former educator with licensure in special education, deaf and hard of hearing, and social studies with an emphasis in history, political science, and sociology. She has over six years of teaching and coaching experience in low socioeconomic schools in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So at this point, um, just a few overview about how, how this can run. In order to have the best experience for all of us, if we can stay muted, that helps um, with, with general sound issues. I will be monitoring the written chat, and so any questions you have as you go through, I will be sure to chime in and allow Shannon and Dina to answer them. So you can do that as we go along, and we'll have a great interactive session. And I know that Shannon and, Shannon and Dina will share a whole bunch of great information with you all. So. At this point, I'm going to stop my screen share and let Shannon take over. Okay, Shannon, oh, I let me get my audio. Oh, I got you. <laughs> Thank you're, you. You're good. I got you unmuted. Okay, so I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, can I share my screen? Green. All right, there we are. Let's get going. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, for joining us today. My name is Shannon Sims, and um, I'm with Mockingbird Education. Just so you know, I am in I'm in El Salvador today. <laughs> We're doing workshops here, and we had to sit outside. So if you see here any ambient laughter, it's because everyone is having their recesso or their break time this morning. So I apologize for any of that. <laughs> um, but let's get going. Uh, let's start with our webinar, the No Comprehension Without Picturing. Are you ready to dive in? So, um, Suzanne mentioned this a few times in the beginning of uh, the session. We burst out a few options for pre-work. There's a video on our website. If you didn't get to the pre-work, that's okay. We'll send a link to that afterwards. It's mainly a video that gives you some depth around uh, some of the background knowledge we use to, to create this webinar experience and also just some more information about Mockingbird education. So we'll send that out afterwards. Thank you to those of you who have done that. Also wanted to say thank you. I noticed a lot of people were on the signing in and there are a lot of people who know Mockingbird really well and we have really great relationships with you. So it's wonderful to see you popping up to, to do the webinar. Thank you for that. And I uh, wanted to say hello to all of our new people. And also thank you, uh, Suzanne, for having Mockingbird join. Thank you so much today. So I'll start by sharing a little bit about Mockingbird Education briefly. We're based out of Dallas, Texas. Um, we, this is the world in which we teach. We work in completely vulnerable learning environments. So we work with learners who are experiencing um, poverty, demotivation, apathy, gang experience, homelessness, parenthood, a lot of the same things that you see every day with learners. And this because this is, I know, I don't really know any other teaching. I was a national K-12 educator. Um, everything that has been to serve this situation of um, is instructional learners, which means that we design instructional experiences and curriculum learning populations. And that curriculum and those that instructional experience is based in over 60 years of research. 
Um, our clients are helping young people typically, and, and adults too, typically transition into three areas. We're helping learners with um, basic education or transitioning into post-secondary education. We're also helping learners with uh, development of life and navigational skills so they know what to do when we're not there anymore and they're out in the world on their own. And then finally, and probably most importantly, we're helping learners transition into employment because we know employment reduces recidivism and um, incarceration rates and it helps people be self-sustainable. That work takes us all over the world. Like I said, I'm in El Salvador today. And we serve clients um, post-secondary education in K-12 to nonprofits and CBOs, workforce development, adult education, and adult and juvenile corrections. Here are some of our partners in the United States. You can see we have Digital Promise on there. Another one to note is the, our relationship with GED Testing Services. Mockingbird is one of three professional development providers in the nation that is endorsed by GEDTS to help us prepare for those changes that happened in 2014. And we also do work internationally. Uh, we work with Youth Build International, University of Peace, Catholic Relief Services. And here is the work that we really do. Um, what we're really trying to do for learners is help them create this identity as a learner. Learners come to us and they have this relationship with their thoughts, feelings, and actions that doesn't support the identity of being a learner. Um, and so they're resistant, they're apathetic, they're, they're vulnerable. And um, our job is to really, this, to do more than just teach them skills, to help them create the, their thoughts, feelings, help them vulnerable and apathetic to a learner who has, a, has an identity as I can learn, I can, um, I'm a long learner, and I know how to work with my thoughts, my feelings, and actions. What we know about it's incredible, and transformation takes a lot of time. And for us, that we don't have time with ours. We have a population that is um, very hard to retain. They go, and so do is about building, building learners and keeping learners involved. Okay, okay. Oh. I heard that we might be breaking up a little bit. Is the audio still okay? Um, Shannon, I have I've turned off your video. It's it's generally okay. Um, okay. It just it it's well. I mean, but maybe it's better for me than for Beth. Um, maybe if you slow down talking a little bit, we'll catch you a little bit better. It, sure. It's not constantly breaking up, but every now and then it does. Okay. Yep. We'll slow down just a bit to accommodate the bandwidth. Um, so we know that that transformation takes time and we know that transformation is really difficult. And the reason, and so this is really um, a quote that, that, that really drives Mockingbird's work with young people and with adults. Um, people need a powerful why if they're going to endure the difficulty of the how. And the how that we're asking learners to engage in is really, really challenging. Um, it's gonna take a lot of investment and there's a lot of opportunities for learners to quit. And so for them to be able to stay engaged in that how, we need to provide them with lots of why. And that starts with Mockingbird sharing our why. Um, so, so here's Mockingbird's why for the work that we do. Um, it's this image right here. We, uh, we see this thing in, in the United States and internationally too where we're building all these prisons to accommodate learners and not so much educational opportunity. So what we want to do is really be able to um, incorporate more opportunities for education. Um, and the reason why we do this is because these are often the words that we use to describe and define our learning population, um, but we know that, that these are the words that define them too. We know that they're curious, they're invested, they will take risk, they're resilient, um, and they have lots and lots of life experiences. And so we want to design an educational experience that capitalizes on these assets. So today here is the agenda. Um, first, we'd like to talk a little bit about just the landscape of adult education, what is changing in, with respect to, uh, to literacy, um, the difference between learning to read skills and reading to learn skills, and then how can we blend these reading to learn and learning to read skills directly into a, um, explicit instruction for reading and literacy. My commitment to you is I will share concrete strategies for how to do that, when to do that, and then most importantly, how do we integrate some technology into all of this too so we can build tech technology literacy. So here is the state of the adult basic education field in the United States. Um, 
the field of adult education is changing for us and the reason why that is changing is because entry-level employment has changed. When the tests first started coming out, when high school equivalency first started coming out, um, it was there was a lot of jobs that, that were manual labor jobs and now we have this influx of, of technology where we can computerize a lot of those manual labor, labor, labor jobs and so entry-level employment is, re is requiring learners to use both physical skills but also mental skills and processing skills. Um, this is why Mockingbird really values our relationship with Digital Promise is because we know that um, for learners to be successful in the field, we have to figure out how to build literacy and technology for them. Um, we know that we have to, we know that we have to build literacy and technology for them and we know that we have to incorporate that into what, we're, what it is that we're already doing. And so this globalization or this change is requiring the shift from just teaching procedural skills to moving into this idea of conceptual knowledge. How do we build more conceptual knowledge and that's not typically what education has done. We've worked more on procedural knowledge gaps and how do we fill those in and we have to make a shift. Mockingbird calls this the difference between base skills and climbing skills. So we have, um, we have base skills, we can define those. Base skills are entry point skills, they're foundational skills, skills we typically build over time um, and climbing skills are skills that require existing schema, prior knowledge, and prior experience. It's, it's cutting out a lot, okay. I will try to keep going. I'm sorry for our internet connection. <laughs> I guess it's not so great here. So let's try this. Let's try this and maybe we can send a chat out. Um, don't solve this equation. I'm going to use a mathematical example to talk about base skills and climbing skills just to create a shared frame of reference. We sort of all know how this works in math. Um, what are the skills that a learner would need to know? What are the skills that a learner would need to know to be able to solve this equation? Um, if you would please engage in remind.com. Dina is going to send out a uh, text. I think she's already done it. And you should see that on your phone if you're using that or um, or you could reply on Remind, or if you want to use the chat box, that's okay too. Um, just tell us some of those skills that people would need to know to be able to solve this equation. Whoop. And maybe Suzanne can share some of the chat things that are coming through. If Absolutely, I'll do that if any come on here. Um, so we have from Candy, steps of the solving sequence. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, so steps knowing, knowing order of operations. Uh, it looks like Dina's getting some responses uh, for subtraction, multiplication. Um, Rachel comments. Division, multiplication, yeah. Um, simplification, Rachel says how to simplify it, combining the X's and the inverse operations. Absolutely. Great. Uh, we have, um, on the Remind app, we just had somebody call or send in um, that we would need to have some numbers. Um, algebraic reasoning. Excellent. Thank you for participating in that. We appreciate it. All of these things are the background skills that learners would need to know to be able to solve this equation. Um, and that really exemplifies the fact that we have so much to teach and not a lot of time to teach it in. Um, so Mockingbird would take those skills, all of those skills that a learner would be responsible for, and we would divide those into base skills and climbing skills. And so you can see on the screen here, a lot of the things that some of the participants have mentioned, um, base skills, we need number times, addition, subtraction, multiplication, they need to understand place value. Um, and then those climbing skills, there's an order, they need to know order of operations, the concepts of equality, algebraic reasoning, simplification, um, all of those things and what we know about our learners is that there's a massive gap between those two um, and that gap 
and not knowing leads to a resistance and an apathy and a demotivation in our learners. Um, and it also leads to those same qualities in our educators too, because we have to decide all the time, am I going to focus on the base skill or am I going to focus on the climbing skill? And the truth is we all know that our learners really need both. So what Mockingbird tries to do is we try to create this idea of a training will and we don't mean that disrespectful to learners or to make learners feel like children but it really is to provide a resource and support for learners um, so they can practice that climbing skill at the same time they're building proficiency in those base skills. So a really great example of this in math is the multiplication table. If any of you have taught math, you'll know that um, oftentimes when we're working on equations, we can give a learner a multiplication chart and they can use that chart to work through the mathematics skill um, while they're solving and working on the algebraic skill of the equation. Um, and the question that Mockingbird always has is how can we use the same idea, the same concept in, in everything? Um, so Mockingbird tools really help us do two things at the same time. It helps us teach those base learning to read skills at the same time we're teaching learners the process of using learning as a or reading as a vehicle for learning. The research on that shows that reading comprehension for learners improves when teachers provide explicit comprehension strategy instruction. So when we stop and we don't make assumptions about what our learners know when it comes to reading and we explicitly teach them comprehension strategies, we know that their comprehension of reading goes up and the research supports this. So let's first start by creating a shared frame of reference for the difference between literacy see or what literacy even means um, so literacy when we talk about that term we mean the ability to read and interpret words signs images and gestures and what we know about literacy is that text is not enough our learners are responsible for for reading charts graphs tables all those political cartoons on the high school equivalency test and so all that visual literacy and that's the ability to see understand and ultimately think, create, and communicate graphically. So what Mockingbird tries to do is to create tools where we can build both of these skills at the same time. And these tools, um, let's start by first looking at the tool itself and then we'll share the, tr the strategy that goes with the tools. So the first strategy we have here is what we call our talk to text strategy. Um, this image holds all of that together. Um, that image helps us reduce the cognitive load for learners. We'll share a little bit more about that later. But the purpose, and the second tool is visualize, connect, and question. Um, we have a couple of more tools that go with literacy, but we'll focus on these two tools today. Um, so the they do. Yeah, it is on my computer that my internet, sorry, sorry if that's yeah. happening. Um, so it combines base skills and climbing skills together. Um, and what that does, just like that multiplication. Yeah, if we can well, pause, Shannon, can you just pause for a minute? Your sound is your better. Um, just can I? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Suzanne, tell me what to do and I can do it, I promise. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're back um, now. It had, just, it had just dropped for a minute, but we can okay. do you again now. So the tool, com it's better now? Yes. Go ahead. Shannon. I can't. Okay, I can go ahead. Okay, um, so our tools combine base skills with climbing skills. And what that does is it really um, creates uh, an opportunity for learners, just like on that multiplication table, to be able to concentrate on the climbing skill and not be weighed down by working through the base skill. Um, and then we take those base skills and we try to create an opportunity for them to be easy to access from a cognitive perspective. I'll share what that means in a minute. Um, we'll use rote memorization, different mnemonics and patterns, and we'll do this with repeated practice and exposure to ultimately 
successfully develop learner independence in the tool itself. Um, the idea for this is that we're going to reduce the cognitive load. Um, research tells us that a lot of our learners who are vulnerable and come from a background of lots of academic failure um, have working memory, um, have, have difficulty in working memory, um, which means that there's more, there's a whole lot more working on in their pan. We call working memory the frying pan, and that's because it's limited and there's only so much space for processing in the mind. Um, and so when we ask learners to work on base skills and climbing skills and putting all that together at the same time, they easily get overwhelmed. This impacts their ability to process um, with respect to speed, volume, and the energy that it takes. Current studies demonstrate that when students experience explicit instruction of comprehension strategies, it improves their comprehension of new texts and topics. Um, the purpose of this is to build learning to read skills at the same time. We're gonna build reading to learn skills. And the tools, um, we use these tools very, very specifically for vulnerable learners. So we instruct with these tools very, very specifically. If you've been to a Mockingbird training before, you'll, you'll recognize this series in the sequence. Um, but here's what we know about working with vulnerable learning populations, is that learners have to be actively engaged engaged. They must be involved uh, beyond listening to chance for new learning. And our experience shares that we all know that um, sit and get is not effective, right? Um, and what we also know about vulnerable learning populations is that learners show up to our programs and they're not ready to participate in an active level in our programming. This is sort of the experience we get, right? They come in, they're resistant, they're very, um, they're very cautious, they're watching, they're, do I want to engage? And we're constantly pulling them forward. Ah, oh, this is good for you. Come on, we're going to help you. And it's this struggle and this battle that we have with young people all the time. Um, can look like that, right? <laughs> And you can call in people to help you, you get staff in to help you, but we still have this resistance. So the way we present these tools to our young people and to our adult learners really, really matter. Um, it's very, very critical that we don't just give them the tool and walk away, but that we do it in a very supportive and intentional way. So I'll share with you quickly the, the teaching process that Mockingbird will use. Um, what's really important to know is that every strategy or tool that we use for literacy or any tool for that matter that Mockingbird would use is divided into a series of successive steps. Um, you can see here this is our active literacy application and we have three very clear steps to that to that entire thing about active literacy. We're going to talk about the first two um, in just a few minutes. Uh, but we break things down into what we call an entry point strategy or a hatch strategy, and then um, a moderate strategy or a fledge strategy, and then we move on to the fly stage. Uh, gradual release. When we talk about gradual release, what we mean is that we're, we're always going to provide that why for the learners. Why is this really important? Um, I'll model it for my learners so they know what the expectation is when we use the tool. Then we'll practice it in a very safe way together before I ever expect them to independently practice with the skill. And then finally, I think one of the most important things to, to note when we work with vulnerable learning populations is that we often begin outside of the text. And we do this for two reasons. Um, the first reason is risk. Learners who have had lots of academic failure and a history with failure of reading or um, struggle with that concept of reading, uh, it's a risky thing for them to do. And unfortunately, you know, everybody, it's okay to not be so great at math in our society. People look at math and they say, oh, I'm not good at math. And everybody sort of understands that. When it comes to reading, there's a lot of social, social shame that comes from not being a reader or having literacy problems in general. And so creating place that's safe for learners to access literacy skills um, outside of the text first just makes it more safe for them to engage. The other reason why we work outside of the image first is because, um, as you all experience all the time, we have this massive issue with differentiation, which means that I can tell you in my own experience, I taught in a one-room schoolhouse and I had learners who were reading at a first grade level in the same room that I had learners that were almost ready to go to college. And I had to meet all of those literacy needs at the same time. And that that's something that's too real and incredibly challenging for young people and for our educators and for adults. And so 
starting with imagery helps me teach the tool directly to all of my learners at the same time. So then I can differentiate different levels of text to, I can differentiate with different levels of text depending on how people are doing in my class. So I could give, we could use the same tool once we understand it using an image and then differentiate the levels of text when they're ready to. So let's talk. Okay. And cutting. Yeah, it's, um, it's, been, it's been good, Shannon, but it's cutting in and out right now. So let's just, you know, count to 30. And okay. We'll just hang out for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I, I can hear you now. So <laughs> give it a whirl. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> so uh, I'll share with us the talk to tech strategy. What we'll We'll do with this is I will um, I will mock strategy but if you are not mind Dean is going to send a text to you that will have the article that I'm about to read so if you want to have the article right in front of you on your cell phone you can um, but it's not a big deal because I'll put the article up on the screen for us uh, before I model I'll share a little bit about what talk to text is um, let's define that strategy it's really helping learners, helping vulnerable learners engage their inner voice um, and helping them create this relationship or this dialogue with tech reading. Sometimes we've all and then we have all the the bottom paragraphs no idea what we've just okay. Are yeah. you okay? Um yeah. Just just give it a minute. I think we're gonna need to hear again the last couple of sentences of what you said? Sure, I can. Yep. Is it better now? I think so. Let's try. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. Internet. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the talk to text strategy helps learners build a relationship with text while they're reading. Um, it's, it's, We've all gotten to the bottom of a paragraph while we're reading and had no idea what we've just read, right? And that's because we are decoding and we're not interacting with the text or comprehending or a conversation with helps learners um, to be able to build fluency, helps them with deconstructing text and then constructing text. Um, the purpose is to recognize their internal voice inside their heads talking, um, but not recognize that, uh, also engage that voice intentionally while they're reading text. And then I think most important is to help learners really build comfort with processing information, um, to be able to help them not see something and say, I, I, don't, I don't know how to do that and shut down. I feel like, um, this is something that if we could help our learners build comfort with that, it would change the game for them in terms of, of literacy skills. But what's really, 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 really critical is that the goal for this strategy is not that learners walk away from the text uh, with comprehension yet. This is, this is just a strategy to show learners, here's some text, here's how I'm supposed to think while I'm reading. So I'll model this strategy for us. Um, after I model it, then we can have some people either by the chat window or through the Remind app text in and uh, share with us some of the things that they noticed. So I could start here outside of the text by reading out loud this image. Um, I, I'm going to use text for this example just because I feel like once we understand how to do it with text, it will be really easy for people to do it with an image. Um, but this is a, a little hook into what it is we're about to read. <laughs> All right. So here is the talk to text strategy. All right, so I'm looking at this article and I see this bottle of milk and there is a cockroach in it and that is super disgusting. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Um, okay, the title, Cock cockroach milk, anyone, huh? Uh, that sounds absolutely disgusting. It makes me think, is the milk coming from the cockroach? Are they putting cockroaches in milk? I don't know. I'm going to have to read this to find out some more information. 
Okay, do you prefer your morning cereal with skim milk, whole milk, my, well, I normally drink 2% milk, okay, or cockroach milk? All right, I'm gonna need to know a little bit more about that cockroach milk information. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. Okay, an international team. Okay, international, that word. Let me think about that word for just a second. An international team. International means uh, more than just the United States, probably people all over the world. So a, pe a team of people from all over the world. Okay, got it. Uh, of researchers in India recently discovered that the Pacific beetle cockroach secretes um, secretes. Oh, I remember I word, learned that word last week, and that means to like produce or to ooze out. So they these cockroaches. These so first of all, these researchers in India they discovered that there's this cockroach, and it oozes out this substance. It's packed with protein, fats, amino acids, and sugars. Oh, those are all things that are supposed to be good for you, but maybe not fats and sugars. But they're things we consume and we eat. That makes sense why this would be associated with milk. Okay, it makes it one of the most nutritious substances on earth. Huh, that's interesting. There's so many places here that need help with nutrition, so many places in the world. Uh, I wonder if they're thinking about using this to help with that. Interesting. This is not, however, your traditional cup of milk. In fact, it's not a liquid, but a crystal form formed in the gut of infant roaches. Huh, okay, so that's super interesting to me. Um, so they've got this milk. This milk has all of this nutritional value in it, and they make it by these infant or baby cockroaches that secrete this crystal that's supposed to be super good for you. Okay, scientists plan to make crystals into a supplement to help fight malnutrition. Ah, so I am right. They are gonna maybe use this to help people. Uh, please pause. If you would please, in the chat box or in the Remind app, uh, please send us some, some notes about what it is that you have observed. What are the things that I'm doing while I'm modeling this strategy? And then we'll build on that together. Maybe Susan can help us with the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Linda has written connection, you're modeling connection to prior knowledge. Uh-huh, definitely. Connection to prior knowledge, how does this relate to what I already know? Yep. Diana has written making predictions. Ah, predictions, yes, absolutely. Dina got on the Remind app for asking questions, um, wondering, out, paraphrasing, wondering things out loud, stopping the process. It's not about speed. Dina has written talking out unknown words. Yeah, talking out unknown words. Yes, all of these things. Thank you for participating. We really appreciate that interaction. Um, yes, all of these things are happening incredibly intentionally. Um, I'll share some why and break that down. When typically educators read to learners, what they model is something that sounds, um, sounds more like this. Do you prefer your morning cereal with skim milk, whole milk, or cockroach milk? An international team of researchers in India recently discovered that the Pacific beetle cockroach secretes a substance packed with proteins, fats, amino acids, sugars, making it one of the most nutritious substances on earth. What I'm modeling there for learners truly is good decoding skills. But what I'm not modeling for learners, because I am a proficient learner, reader myself, is the process of working through and breaking down thinking. So when a vulnerable learner watches the model of the educator, watches the learner of the educator, or the model of the educator, and they see that um, that educator is reading so proficiently and so, with such fluency, they think that is good reading. But what they don't see is that there is this, um, this, this whole process that's happening cognitively under the surface. And how will they know to access that process if it's not modeled for them? So this talk to text strategy is super critical for helping learners engage in that process of, it's not just about reading the words beautifully and correctly and with fluency. It's more about 
working through the language and asking ourselves these questions and thinking out loud as we're reading, predicting, and doing all these things. Um, and it starts, truly it starts with the educator modeling the strategy first. Reading is not just pronouncing words. It's making meaning out of what the author has written and comprehension can be improved by this art of talking through and, and having a conversation with the text on the page. Um, and what we know is that internal dialogue, using our learners internal dialogue is a skill that is explicitly taught. And, and teaching metacognitive skills, maintaining an internal dialogue while reading is important for de developing comprehension. Here's the other thing that's a kicker is that 50% of reading comprehension is based on what the reader brings to the text by their prior knowledge or their schema and internal dialogue. So that opportunity for them to comprehend the text really, really depends on how they're using their voice, how they're wondering about things, how they're willing to work through instead of shut down and quit. And we've all seen learners do that. So that is the talk to text strategy. Um, it's a strategy that if that was our entry point, that's, that's what we would do. As educators, we would just model that strategy for our learners. And then over time, we would gradually release that practice to, to the learners themselves to where it would start by me doing it as the educator. And then over time, learners would begin to do this process um, in, in your own classroom. Now let's look at the visualize, connect, and question strategy. Uh, you can look here. So this is a very concrete three-step process, and it helps learners understand what it is that they should do while they're engaging with the text or the image. Um, we'll use an image to model this strategy, um, and I'll use Dina to help me uh, work through this as if she were one of my learners. Um, the purpose of this strategy is so learners know exactly what it is that they should be doing when they're trying to comprehend text. So it's not just enough to wonder and be okay with struggling anymore. Now we're moving closer and closer to comprehension. And through that process, um, this is explicit instruction on three very critical things that learners need to do while they're reading text. Um, this also helps us target very specific research-based gap skills, and it helps us build proficiency in those base skills. The very first part of the strategy is called visualize. Um, and when we visualize, here's what I know, is that learners have absolutely no idea that while they read the text, they're supposed to be creating this image or this picture in their head. Like, like a movie in their head while they read. Um, so we explicitly teach this to learners. And this is super, super important because there is absolutely positively, it's the name of this entire workshop, no comprehension without picturing. Um, yeah, I'll prove that for us. Um, if you're having trouble with your bilateral accessory naviculars, you're gonna want to go and see a doctor for that. Curious about what your mind is doing right now. Uh, you're probably looking at these words and trying to break them down, trying to make more sense out of them. So we're looking at bilateral. Okay, bi, you know, bi means two. Lateral means side. Um, we have accessory. Um, so that's maybe extra. Naviculars, I don't really know what that word means. Huh, it's interesting. Um, but if I were to tell you, if you're having trouble with the small extra bones in your ankles, you're going to want to see a doctor for that. You would understand that completely. Oh, say it again. I'll see. Um, so I heard the cutout, so I'll say that again. Uh, if you're having trouble with the small extra bones in your ankles, you're going to want to see a doctor for that. Um, and we can understand small extra bones on our ankles because we can picture that, but we can't picture bilateral accessory naviculars. So the very first step of visualize, connect, and question is that we help learners actually visualize and create pictures in their minds. We'll model this with a picture first. Um, Dina has sent out this on the Remind app, this image. Um, and I'll work with her to sort of model how, how I would use this with a learning group. Um, she's just one learner, but you could probably imagine how to use this with the whole group um, through what we're about to do. So, Dina, are you ready? I'm ready. Excellent. Okay, Dina, so we're going to work through this image together. 
Um, the very first thing we're going to do together is we will visualize. So what that means is we need to find all of the visual components we can in this image. Um, we're not making meaning yet. We're not putting things together yet. We're just looking at the visual components. So for me, it's, let's see, I'll, I'll help us get started. An example of this is way up at the top of the image, there is a little white bird in the, in the clouds. Um, so I see a bird up in the clouds in this image. What are a couple of things that you notice? Um, I see a woman. I see a man. I see a big house. It's pink. Um, I see there's a lot of clouds. Yeah. What do you see about the streets? Um, it doesn't look like the streets that I live on. Yeah. Um, I see that they have stones. They're made up of stone. Um, I also noticed, did you notice this too, Dina? I also noticed there's nobody else on the town, like out, out and about, but these two people. It's pretty yeah. empty. I yeah. don't see any cars. Nope, no cars, no, no animals, except for that bird, right? Um, oh, do you notice that window up in the top? It's different than the other windows. Do you see that oh. one up there? Oh yeah, the top, it, it's round. Uh-huh, it's round and dark, right? There's a really dark one up there. Uh, tell me about the clouds. What do you notice about those? You know, the clouds are really dark and it covers the whole sky. Yeah, awesome. Cool, so we've got, let's see, we've got a pink house, we've got a man, we've got a woman. Uh, what, what's going on with that woman's body? Well, it looks like she's running. Uh-huh, yeah, she's in that position where she's definitely active, right? And how's the man standing? He looks sort of stiff and I, I see that he's holding maybe a cane. Uh-huh. Yep, and his other hand maybe is holding his coat, right? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, awesome. So we first we identified all the visual components, and we did this because now we're going to move into making meaning. But we can't make meaning until we have all the parts to, to do that with. Uh, please pause. Thank you, Dina. We're going to pick back up again in connections. This visualized component when we do with, when we, when we work through this with learners, it's super, super important that we spend a good amount of time here because learners are very, very quick to want to make sense of things, to want to make meaning of things, and um, creating a lot of discipline around visualizing and finding all of the components um, is really, really, really important. So that way they have enough information to make meaning later, right? Um, Research shows that proficient readers create mental images spontaneously, both spontaneously and purposely during and after reading. Visualizing also helps students create non-linguistic representations or understandings of concepts that don't involve words. And what we know from a cognitive perspective in the mind is that pictures take up a whole lot less space than words. Um, and so it, it reduces cognitive load and it helps people hold ideas together. So we'll move on to this next stage of visualize, connect, and question. Um, we'll model this first, but we'll focus on very, three very specific connections, connections to self, connections to the context, and connections to world. Um, Dina, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, awesome. So we're looking at this image, and now that we have all those parts that we talked about, um, let's focus on making connections. We're going to work through three types of connections. We'll start first with uh, self-connections. So self-connection, I'm looking at this image, and it makes me, let's see, I'm seeing that older man, and he's wearing this hat, and that's the same kind of hat that my grandpa Oh, so we're looking through this image. We're going to make connections. First, we'll start with, it's still cutting out, okay. So we're looking at this image. We're going to make self-connections. Nope. <laughs> I, I'm hearing you okay. This is Suzanne. Oh, great, okay, good. Okay, heard, we'll keep going. Yeah, we heard Dina make some self-connections about the man and her grandfather. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, yep, that was me. So we'll just, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> that works. Thank you. Um, so we're looking at this, we're making self-connections, which is how does whatever these things we looked at, how does it relate to ourselves? Um, I'll model for us, Dina, before you get going. I'm looking at this man. His hat reminds me of my grandfather, and he, that makes me really happy because um, he was, he's just a great person or was a really great person in my life. So he makes me really happy. Uh, Dina, do you have any self-connections to this image? Um, I feel like my grandma used to wear skirts like that woman. Um, I haven't seen anything like that recently, and I, I don't think any of my friends would wear that. 
Yeah, <laughs> right. That makes sense. Um, I look at that house and I see see that pink color, and it reminds me of some of the houses I saw in San Francisco. They always had wacky colors. <laughs> Uh, maybe the sky. I mean, it stormed yesterday, and I feel like the sky kind of looked like that. Awesome. Yes. These are really important self-connections. Self, when we relate what we see to what we know, that helps us understand it better. Um, nice work on that. So those are self-connections. Let's look at the next type of connections, which are context connections. So all of those components that we looked at in the visualized stage, how are they connected together? Um, so if I were to look at this image myself, just to talk about what a context connection is. I see the sky that you just mentioned, Dina, and it's really dark and cloudy, and I see that man is holding his coat closed, and it maybe makes me think that, he, that it's chilly outside or there's a storm that's about to happen there. What do you think? Can you see any context connections? Um, yeah, the, I mean, the woman that's running is, is sort of confusing because maybe she's running from the storm. Ah, yeah. Yeah, and she's got something in her hand. Can you see that there? We didn't oh, see yeah. that. Here. Yeah, no, I see it. So I'm wondering how that how that might be connected. Because is she is she running from the storm or where could she be running to? Maybe she's running to give the man whatever's in her hand. Potentially. That's really good thinking. Um do you see other connections we can make in here? Like how is the house related to everything? What do you think? Well, I'm noticing that, I mean, we said it was pink, but the houses in the background are very, um, they're gray, they're white, they're gray, uh, so this house kind of stands out. Definitely. It's definitely different from the other, other places. Um, I wonder, I, I'm thinking that maybe she, she, she's not dressed the way he is, right? Like, do you see that? She doesn't have the same kind of clothing on, and she's running. I wonder if wherever she left, it was from, from like a hurried place or something, right? Sure. Yeah, it makes me think that maybe, maybe what's going on in that letter might be really important. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, please pause. So those are context connections, and we could obviously keep going. There's a whole lot of connections to be made here. You know, where's the light? Is what she have in her hand good news or bad news? We could lead learners through this process. Um, but let's move to the last step. We'll model that, and that's questions. So the first step is we visualize. We find all the parts of the image. Then we make connections between all of the different components. And then the last thing is we ask questions. And these questions are specific for comprehension. What would we need to ask this learner, or ask this um, author, if we really wanted to be able to understand the author's intention? Um, so, Dina, let's work on some questions here. If, if we could talk to the author of this image, what, what could we ask them? Like, what would help us know more about what he was trying to communicate to us? Well, I'm kind of curious because I, I haven't seen roads like that before. Maybe when did this happen? Yeah, what time period? That's a great question. I might ask what the title of the image is. What are other questions, Dina? What can we do? Um, I'm wondering maybe why that house is pink and, and what's so special about that house. Yeah, that's a great question because it's definitely different. Um, and that window that you pointed out before, that's super dark and all the other windows look a little bit more friendly and I'm kind of curious about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely want to know that the time not not the time he's trying to represent in the image itself, but but the time period it was that he painted or she painted um, painted this image. That might help us have some more information too. Beautiful. Thank you, Dina. That was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate your help. <laughs> Um, so we can work through with pictures to use this tool of visualizing, connecting, and questioning um, to teach the strategy of that to all of my learners at the same time. And then um, that helps me build, oh, this is a funny joke, uh, text to text, text to self, text to world, leave it to school to take the fun out of texting. <laughs> um, but really, that's, those are the connections that we know and research tells us that learners need to be making as they read, so that way they can build more comprehension skills.
Um, we know that learners comprehend better when they make those very specific types of questions. So this is a visualize, connect, and question strategy. Um, and we can use this strategy, of course, with imagery like we just used. Um, but what we can also do is we can use, I, I skipped these slides. These are about questions. So we know that, this is really critical, we know that educators often ask questions for learners after they read. So we'll read a bit of text and then we'll pause, we'll ask questions, what does it mean? But this is really, um, research is telling us that, that it's more important to ask questions during in the process of reading while after it's reading and during the reading process too for comprehension. And this strategy is really important because we can use visual connect and question for uh, for pictures like we just did we can use it to help break down political cartoons and we know that our learners really really struggle with that strategy um, we also know that uh, our learners struggle with graphs all the time so visualize connect and question can help us with that um, cycles charts models infographics um, and different also we can use it with text right like we could read through this work through what are the images we're creating while we're doing that what are the different connections between ourselves the world um, and uh, and then we can also work through um, other other things with text so that is our strategy the first one was talk to text the second one was visualize connecting question I know that they were modeled pretty rushed I uh, want to let you know that we'll send out an email after that has links to videos that have going a little more depth and if you want even more depth and more information um, Mockingbird has workshops public workshops coming up in the fall where um, where we will demonstrate a lot more of our methodology um, here are some of the dates and locations across the United States and you can register for those workshops online at uh, our website www.mockingbirdeducation.net uh, I thank you so much for participating in, in the Active Literacy webinar. I apologize for the connection issues we had for doing this in another country, um, but I deeply appreciate your commitment to your field, to our learners, and for joining us today. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. And we have a few minutes left. If there are any questions you have, um, you can type them in the chat or try to unmute and see how it goes. Um, I do appreciate your patience with that. We did study out well, Shannon. Um, good. We were, yeah, so we were good from that. And as you're typing questions, um, also I will be sending out an email after this to all of you all with um, the link to MockingbirdEducation.net and we will have um, also in our newsletter will be a link to all of these workshops too. Okay, so we have a question from Mercedes. So once we learn the technique, we can use it freely or is it copyrighted? Oh my goodness, um, Mockingbird's mission is to change education for vulnerable learning populations. So once you have this technique, please use it with your, with your learners. Please share it with them. Please use it with your programs. Um, you know, the only thing we ask is, you know, if it works for you and you find it effective, please share Mockingbird with people and your, and your fellow educators. Um, so that way, that way they find us too, right? Um, but no, our, our mission is to make sure that everybody uses the strategy. Um, and it starts with modeling it ourselves as educators and then gradually releasing that responsibility of the tool with, uh, over to our learners themselves. Yeah, that's a great question, Mercedes. Thank you. Yeah, and I will give credit to Shannon and Dina for doing that modeling now. Often we come to these webinars and they're not taught the way we're being told to teach. And so. That, that. That's a really important commitment Mockingbird has to our field of education. Uh, I know for me, I, I went to, I love going to workshops, I love professional development, but uh, can we stop talking about teaching and model it, right? <laughs> uh, what does it look like? Adult education, we don't have that. Mock, adult education doesn't have strong models. And so how do, we, how do we move from that and stop talking about teaching and really just start to model what good teaching looks like? Great, great. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Tyga was sharing that she grew up in the Philippines. <laughs> Oh yeah, so we got a we got a message on um, this is great. We got a message uh, from Dido, and they were saying regarding the cockroach milk. I was born in the and raised in the Philippines, and these critters that are found in rice fields. They call them 
Kamaru, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and they're considered delicacies. <laughs> but she's not going to drink cockroach milk. <laughs> That's a beautiful self-connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mercedes has a question. This deck will be available. I will be sending out, I've recorded this webinar, and so you will get a copy of the recording. And Shannon, do you want to talk about resources available on the on your website? Yeah, so we have videos that go into the process of that, but because, um, so this is our intellectual property, right? Our, our slide decks are what our trainers use. So, so Mockingbird isn't typically in the practice of sending out our, our slide decks. Um, I can send you some, I can upload some PDFs though, so you have the model itself, uh, especially for that visualized connecting question. Sometimes just having that on a paper um, is super helpful. Um, and so, so I'll make sure some PDFs are on our website for that. And we'll send that link out for everybody so they have it. Um, I got a message from Rochelle. Thanks for the refresher, Shannon. It was so good that you could be here, Rochelle. Thank you for, for joining us. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm using my good teacher wait time right now. You are. Yes, I know it's so hard to wait, right? <laughs> okay. Well, great. Well, we appreciate um, the hour that you have spent with us. We hope maybe you got something, well, at least East Coast time, you got something to eat as well. Um, and um, we will have future webinars that will be posted in different places. And we would love you to join, to have you join us to learn more about adult education and promoting great learning with our adults. So thank you all, and we will see you on another webinar. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I really enjoyed. Excellent. Good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I got some great resources. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. Hopefully, okay. we'll run into you again around the walk. <laughs> yes. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye, Mary. Okay, bye. Um, and, and Shannon, those links that you, that you have to send out, uh -huh. um, if you would send them to me and I can put it all together into an email through the Eventbrite um, okay. and do that. And then, um, and that, that works, right? Yeah, that's great. I can send you those. Um, is it possible for Mockingbird to know who registered for this just so that way we can um, know like which of our people 